All right. Uh, I am Amy Nelson, Executive Director of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, and we welcome you to this press conference today and the debut of our new fair housing exhibit, Unwelcomed, a Fair Housing History of Sales and Lending Discrimination. Before we go any further, I want to have Connie Scott of the Indianapolis Central Library say a few words of welcome. Connie? Thank you, Amy, and welcome. My name is Connie Scott. I am the Area Resource Manager for Central Library. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Our mayor is here, the Fair Housing Center of Indiana is here, our STEAM guests, local dignitaries. We are happy that you are here. We are happy to partner with the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana to educate the public about the history of the Fair Housing Act, which protects people from discrimination when they are renting or buying a home. Initially, when I met with uh, Amy to talk about the display, my mind went to the movie, A Raisin in the Sun. And if you recall, there was one character from the Housing Authority, Mr. Linder. So as we celebrate and as you view this, I hope that you can uh, learn more information from our library. In fact, on Thursday, April 14th from 6 to 7.30, we will have a data and drafts home loans and redlining uh, uh, program. What is redlining? How does it impact housing, segregation, and economic opportunity in Indianapolis today? So please, if you're able, please come down to Central on Thursday, April 14th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And you can learn about all of the other resources and programs that we have at our website, ndpl.org. Once again, welcome and enjoy. Thank you. Today we are honoring the 54th anniversary of the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act back in 1968, a law passed only one week following the death of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This year, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana is celebrating its 10th anniversary. During those 10 years, there have been highs and lows, but more wins than losses. Along those 10 years, we're immensely proud of our work in challenging discriminatory housing practices. We remain to this day the only fair housing center in Indiana, despite states around us having several centers. At the center, we work for a better America through a fair housing law, a truly strong and impactful law that unfortunately has never had the full legislative, judicial, administrative, and financial support to fight housing discrimination as needed. Yet, fair housing centers like ours across the country help victims of housing discrimination get justice under the law and also do systemic-based work to confront the harmful practices impacting so many. The Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana has an extremely committed team in place who believe in our mission. We also have a strong board of directors, many of which are here present today. As we have become more active in sales and lending investigations, we found that there were so many Hoosiers who are unfamiliar with the policies and practices that historically blocked home ownership for so many. In recent years, we have worked with a great team at Space Flower to educate the public on these actions through short videos on redlining, real estate discrimination, reverse redlining, redlining and historic barriers such as to visualize the racial covenants that were put in place across our city, the redlining map, which still haunts our neighborhoods to this day, the spite fences erected to drive deserving black homeowners out just because of the color of their skin. It was white homeowners, government and industry groups allowing bias, discrimination and intimidation to determine who lived where. It was these actions that have led to the staggering home ownership gap we have today. And what are those rates? As outlined in our most recent report, uh, Marion County is far below state and national averages in home ownership rates across race and ethnicities. Among white homeowners, Marion County has a 65% rate home ownership rate. But for blacks or African Americans in Marion County, that rate is only 34% versus 65. 
nearly half the white rate. For Hispanics and Latinos, it is only 39%, and Asians are at 52%, still a large gap between whites. This has resulted in continuing housing discrimination with people being forced to live in substandard housing conditions. Landlords sexually harassing tenants, people with disabilities lacking accessible housing, and families with children being shut out of far too many planned communities. Today we come to you with a new tool for education, this exhibit, which has brought our videos to life, but also added in far more information than we had room for in the video on topics like blockbusting, steering, neighborhood intimidation, anti-discrimination policies, racial covenants, and of course, redlining. The exhibit is made up of 11 total panels exploring these topics, as well as modern day forms of sales and lending discrimination. The QR codes lead to, if you each, um, almost every panel has a QR code that leads to our videos, reports, and other uh, information. We also have a website that builds off the exhibit with additional resources for those who want to dig into these issues further. This exhibit by no means will correct past wrongs, but maybe it will lead to more discussion as to how we can correct those harmful acts. How can we fix disparities in black homes being so undervalued in appraisals? The loss of bank branches in our neighborhoods of color. How to fight displacement when the neighborhood finally gets needed investment. How families and people with disabilities suffer high rates of housing discrimination. But it's our hope it will open more minds to have the type of discussions to engage and determine meaningful ways for corrective action. Finally, this exhibit was possible due to the support of First Merchants Bank. Several of their um, leadership are here today. It could not have been possible without the amazing talent of Jordan Ryan of the History Concierge, Jessica Dunn of the Br of Brain Twins. If you are looking for a researcher and archivist, you need to talk to Jordan. If you are looking for a designer, who designed all these panels, please talk. Um, please talk to Jessica. I also want to give a big thank you to Anointed Hands for their ASL interpretation today as well. The execution and management of this exhibit was a result of the great work of the Fair Housing Center's Deputy Director of Administrative and Advocacy, Brady Ripperger, who did so much work to get this where we are today. With support of our team, Will Sanford and Jonte Duversaint. By the way, we're trying to add to our staff by some additional positions, so go to our jobs page. Uh, we have several speakers lined up for today, groups in which the Fair Housing Center is fortunate to have strong working relationships and that results in their ability to be here today. We are so proud of those partnerships, one of which is with the City of Indianapolis and Mayor Joe Hogsett. Mayor um, Hogsett and I actually go uh, quite a few years back, back before his current role, um, he uh, called a meeting and he wanted to talk fair housing and we met and had a a really good discussion about so many of the barriers and gaps and the discrimination that was happening at that time and I am so proud that he was able to be here today and I am up for um, some comments. Mayor Hogsett. Thank you so very much. Well good morning. It doesn't need to be said, but for those who may be your first time with the Fair Housing Center, I just have one uh, bit of advice. <clears throat> Stay out of Amy Nelson's way. <laughs> or said differently, just do whatever she asks you to do. Do what's, right. do what's right you know uh, I am in I'm very very honored to be asked to uh, make some just brief remarks uh, I want to thank uh, the Central Library for uh, hosting us today the ambition that I have for Indianapolis uh, is that we live as one city but to accomplish that we must see, we must name, and we must confront the disparity that prevents unity. 
Part of that process involves a better knowledge of the history of disparity. Without that history, we act only on our presumptions, only on our emotions, only on our prejudices. This exhibit put on by the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana allows any visitor to the library to see how poverty was legally concentrated into racial and ethnic minority neighborhoods. They will see that this practice was neither fleeting nor anecdotal, but rather enduring and comprehensive. They will find housing discrimination was enforced in Indianapolis during the post-war boom for the white American middle class, robbing so many of the chance to build generational wealth in a neighborhood of their choice. They will discover that despite a historic legislative ban in the days following the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., housing discrimination continues today. Our city is fortunate to have groups like FHCCI, groups who hold accountable those who would otherwise exploit vulnerable populations. In fact, I want to bring special attention to recent legal actions they brought which secured funding that will improve accessibility for central Indiana tenants. Today, less than 2% of housing across the nation is considered accessible, falling far short of the nearly 14% of Americans who have mobility-related disabilities. And according to a study from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, that shortfall disproportionately affects minority communities. It is in this light of their success in reducing this disparity that the city of Indianapolis is proud to present the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana with the city's annual Accessibility Award. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. The Accessibility Award recognizes community members who help eliminate barriers for residents, our neighbors, in the deaf, hard of hearing, and disability communities. This allows a fuller, more equitable experience for all of Indianapolis. So, I have presented the, to the executive director, Amy Nelson, this award, and she receives it on behalf of all of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana. May God bless the good work you do, and may God bless our city. One city. Well, that was a little unexpected. Uh, and thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you for the city. Thank you to um, all the little birds that were whispering in ears that apparently we should get an award. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I, we are also honored today to have Diane M. Shelley, Midwest Regional Administrator, Administrator of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, and I'll have Ms. Shelley come up. Uh, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana is a recipient of some city funds as well as uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development funds. Without the funds from HUD, we would not be able to do the enforcement work that we have been able to do uh, in our community at the level that we have been doing that. HUD is 
main funder of a lot of Fair Housing Center's enforcement activities. So with that, I want to turn it over to Ms. Shelley for some comments. Delighted to have you here today. Good afternoon, everyone, mayor, other dignitaries, and the banking industry, and I, the religious community represented by uh, Pastor Green. It is my honor to be here today. I bring you greetings from the secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge. I assure you that she would have loved to have been here today, but she has other commitments throughout the country also celebrating fair housing. So it's my honor to stand here as her representative. I want to thank you for allowing me to partake in the debut of this extremely wonderful exhibit and to celebrate the 54th anniversary of Fair Housing Act here in Indianapolis with such a warm community. Um, the exhibit is just fantastic. Uh, Education is so important about in bringing about changes in our community. We know that where we live makes a difference. It makes a difference in the quality of education our children receive. It makes a difference in the type of health care we receive. It even makes a difference in the air that we breathe. Your homes dictates your hopes, your dreams, your futures, and even your success. Unfortunately, even 54 years after the enactment of the Fair Housing Act, there is still inequities within our country. But I bring you good news. I bring you good news today. I want you to know that the Biden-Harris administration is fast at work trying to root out the inequities in the housing market. And if I could just take a second to highlight some of the wonderful work that is being done. When President Biden was sworn in, he immediately issued an executive order that required that racial inequity be addressed. In response to that, HUD instituted or stated that special purpose credit programs could be used under the Fair Housing Act to address these inequities. Also, President Biden issued a directive to HUD in, that we had to undo the patterns of discrimination and racial inequities within the agency itself. Secretary Fudge immediately issued an opinion that all government entities receiving federal funding must certify that they are advancing the Fair Housing Act. Also, Secretary Fudge recently stated that the Fair Housing Act applies to gender inequalities and protects sexual orientation and, sexu and gender identities. Also recently, HUD, along with 13 other federal agencies, have created what is now called the PAVE Task Force. It's designed to address inequities in the appraisal industry. You can go to pave.hud.gov for more information on that. And I also would like to highlight that over $67 million were earmarked to address the discrimination during these pandemic years that has made the housing situation even worse for underserved communities. But HUD cannot do it alone. It's the partnering with agencies and awardees like the Fair Housing Center here. I want to commend the center for the work that they've done. I want to thank their staff. I want to thank their board of directors. And I definitely want to thank their formidable executive director, Amy Nelson. Without you, it cannot be done. Also, if I could just take a minute to recognize the local HUD staff here in Indianapolis. Uh, Kim Burley Wise, if you could just wave your hand. She is the field office director for the housing of urban and development here in Indiana. 
and she has also taken on the responsibility of assisting me through the Midwest region. That's Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And ironically, this week, we're having a meeting of our field office directors, and they're pre some of them are present in the room. And I just want to thank all my field office directors for the work that they've done. I join everyone here today in commending the Fair Housing Center, but more importantly, I ask you to continue to work with HUD in trying to bring about equity in the housing industry. Thank you so much. And next, I'd like to bring up Jadira Hoptree, Director of the Community Lending and Development, First Merchants Bank. First Merchant provided funds to the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana. And out of those funds, we have created some of the videos that many of you have seen, as well as this exhibit here today. And we didn't start off on the greatest of footing, but we are strong partners now. And we really appreciate the work that First Merchants is doing in our community. Jadira? Buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Jadira Hoptree, and I'm the Director of Community Lending and Development. And I am honored, truly honored, to be here with all of you today. You know, as I walked around, as I looked at the website first, I look at the videos, and then walk around today, I tell you, this is a very impactful exhibit. And I wanted to thank the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana for this initiative because we are visual people, and seeing it here, it really brings it to reality. And that's what we need, so we continue moving the needle and making changes. You know, this also reminds me a lot of our clients. Um, I'm gonna try to say this. Especially one that tells you as, that this is still happening, uh, Miss Sophie. When we close Miss Sophie's loan, a very impactful and beautiful black lady, she took the time to call me and tell me, Jadira, I want to tell you that this is history happening. Because today, I can tell my kids, I can tell my grandkids that homeownership between us is possible. A reality that my parents were not able to accomplish even with good jobs and good credits, they were told they could not buy where they wanted to raise their kids. So we have to live in rental space because they wanted us to live in the area of where uh, we could be better educated. So today, and that was in 2021, I changed this history for my family. So, And I wanted to tell you that in First Merchants, those are the stories that we wanted to continue to create. We are about helping people prosper. We are about helping everyone prosper. prosper. And that we are doing. Uh, it's true that we may not have started in the best footings, but we are making change. And we're doing it by opening banking centers in the, on bank or underserved areas as the banking center that we just recently opened in Avondale Meadows a couple years ago, which has been very good and profitable. <laughs> we are hiring lenders. We are hiring lenders that look like us because they can go and serve our communities. Knowledgeable and very welcoming lenders in the housing and in the small business space. And we started an amazing program, a state-of-the-art mortgage program, Next Horizon, who provides opportunities for those that may not have been able to be in the homeownership space as Ms. Sophie, that provides up to 100% financing and has a down payment assistant to cover closing costs or as well. And it is working. That's the key part. It is working. I am very pleased to tell you that as last year, we have closed over 250 loans in Indianapolis alone, and 40% are from people of colors and minority majority areas. So for all the financial institutions out there, thank you. Learn. Learn that 
Fair lending is good business. It's the right thing to do, but it's good business. It is good business for our communities, and it is good business for us. And First Merchants wanted to reaffirm, we are committed to fair lending. We know that it's going to help us to prosper, as well as going to help us help you prosper in our communities. So thank you for having us here, and look forward to seeing many more people coming to see the exhibit. Thank you, Shira. Thank you. Next, I want to introduce you to Reverend David Green, president of the Concerned Clergy of Indianapolis. Uh, Reverend Green and I have been working together for a number of years. Concerned Clergy of Indianapolis is an organization that has an extremely strong housing platform and fight on issues of social justice. And we, we, like, we like those groups that, um, that get in uh, people's way. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce Reverend Green, who's going to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. Amy, I want to thank you for this exhibit and your organization for the great work that you've done. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedules to be here on today. Now, although the Federal Fair Housing Act was passed more than 50 years ago, housing discrimination unfortunately continues here in our state and in our city. I'm reminded of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King in a speech that he gave over 55 years ago that was entitled The Other America. Dr. King argued that there are two Americas. One America is a beautiful for situation. And in a sense, this America is overflowing with milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity. This America is the habit of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies and culture and education for their minds and freedom and human dignity for their spirits. In this America, millions of people experience every day the opportunity of having life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In this America, millions of young people grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. But Dr. King argues that there is an other America in which many minorities find themselves, which is different. It's an America where millions of people find themselves living in rat-infested, less-than-livable homes. Their access to quality housing is different. I suggest today that this other America is one where we're racial covenants, redlining, neighborhood intimidation, undervalued home appraisals, failure of lenders to finance homes are among a plethora of discrimination tactics that we continue to see in our current society. Dr. King said when speaking about this other America that blacks resided in, they find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. Dr. King suggested for a solution for which we gather here today. He talked about how we must come to see that social progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. And so we must help time. We must realize that time is always right to do what is right. And I'm thankful to be here today because I know the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana is committed to these tireless efforts to make a difference. This exhibit has opened today as an example of their efforts to show the public those two Americas. This exhibit shows how one America, one Indiana, one Indianapolis has been allowed to be prosperous while the other America the other Indiana, the other Indianapolis, has had to go without. I truly believe instead of being locked out, it's time to bring the benefits of home equity and wealth building to more Hoosier families. Black America and black Hoosiers must have its fair share of the American dream. Dr. King, Dr. King closed his speech, and I agree, but he was reminded people of the an African-American hymn that said, we shall overcome. And I truly believe we shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you.
Thank you, Reverend Green. Next, I want to introduce you to Tony Mason, President and CEO of the Indianapolis Urban League. Tony um, will have uh, some comments here today. And again, another um, strong partner with the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana. Hey, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, amen, Reverend Green. Amen. First of all, it's an honor to be here with you today, and I want to start out, and I'll be very brief. Let's give Amy and the Fair Housing team a big round of applause. <laughs> you know, 10 years of impact, but the fight that her and our team lead each and every day in this community is critical to addressing the housing issues that face people of color, and for that matter, all residents in this city. Before the pandemic, as many of you know, Indianapolis was second or third in America in evictions. Second, second okay. And, and think about it when we consider the impact of the pandemic, which has exacerbated all of the challenges. We know that we have uh, outrageous declines in home ownership, access to loans, and as, and as Reverend Green said, uh, the opportunity to have capital and to build wealth is so crucial. And so I'm so thankful for the work that Amy and her team have done. They've been at the table with us at the Urban League as we've crafted out priorities for the Indianapolis African American Quality of Life Initiative, of which it's one thing to, to build affordable housing and to give people the dollars to sustain those, but we have to have the advocacy work that comes with it. And I want to commend Amy for her leadership as well and bringing to the table other grassroots neighborhood-based organizations and churches to be a part of this work because we have to empower and uplift people to do this work each and every day. I have a, a, a unique thing about my background that I'll share with you. I'm from Evanston, Illinois. I grew up in that neighborhood, in that area where if you know the story of Evanston, it's what, the only city that has a reparations program? right now in the country and while it may not be perfect the fact that they dare do it is something we need to entertain here in the city of Indianapolis because for far too long people of color have been subjected to substandard housing still are being subjected to it and do not even have the resources to sustain that and to maintain it and if we want to make sure that Indianapolis becomes the best version of itself, it means that people have access to quality, affordable housing throughout our community. So again, hats off and congratulations to the Fair Housing Center. Amy, you're amazing. Please keep up the work. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Shelly Specchio, Chief Executive Officer of the Mybor Realtor Association. Shelly? Thank you, Amy, and thank you for this powerful exhibit that you have put together. It's, it's extraordinary. And it's such a privilege to be here today with so many of our community's leaders uh, working together really to strengthen this great community. So thank you for including me. Home ownership is the primary contributor to building wealth in America. And because realtors play a pivotal role furthering fair housing, we can advance wealth equity by increasing housing opportunities for those who have been historically disenfranchised and marginalized. To accomplish this, we must first acknowledge our history. Realtor associations, including MIBOR, contributed to practices of discrimination and systemic racism. And in addition, my board failed to admit black real estate professionals as members until years after the civil rights movement. The impact of our actions weighs heavy and can still be seen and felt in our communities. Today, it is our responsibility to take action toward tangible and lasting change for our organization and for our community. My board realtors are actively fighting discrimination. We are committed to providing every potential homeowner access to the home and neighborhood of their choice. Specifically, we're committed to providing our membership with meaningful, practical education on fair housing and other equitable housing practices, bringing diversity to our leadership, membership, and staff, 
holding members accountable if discriminatory practices occur, promoting the success of minority home ownership and eliminating racial inequities in home ownership rates, and being the leading voice for property rights and real estate issues in central Indiana, specifically addressing disparities in minority community home values, equity gaps, and access to credit. This work cannot be accomplished alone. As we move forward, we will partner with industry and community groups for input and collaboration. We will seek opportunities to strengthen our marketplace and empower our members as they help fulfill the dream of home ownership for all, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, national origin, socioeconomic status, political affiliation, or any other quality by which we may define ourselves. My Board Realtor Association represents close to 10,000 realtors in central Indiana and is committed to a membership culture where diversity, equity, and inclusion are integrated into every aspect of our organization. This is our commitment. Join us on our journey to a better future. Thank you. Really appreciated those remarks. Next is uh, Bobby Nagel, President of the Board of Directors of the Central Indiana Realtist Association. Many of you may not be familiar with CIRA, but they are hard at work in our community. CIRA is an organization also celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. In fact, CIRA and the uh, Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana partnered up from all, from, in our very first year and have been active partners uh, working together to try to address disparities when it comes to home ownership. And I'm proud to have Bobby here today who will talk about um, how CIRA came to be. Bobby? Thank you, Amy. Good morning, everyone. Okay, I'm going to talk about how CIRA got started. We started with, um, it's an acronym, NARAB, which stands for National Association of Real Estate Brokers, which was founded in 1947 in Florida. And this was an uh, equal opportunity and civil rights act, uh, advocacy organization for African American uh, people who was in real estate. And the purpose of NARAB is to enhance the economic improvement of its members, community at large, and the minority community which it serves. Although composed principally of African Americans, the realist organization embraces all qualified real estate organizations or practitioners who are committed to achieving our vision, and that is democracy in housing. Local black uh, professionals and real estate groups began uh, 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 moving or forming, if you will, some in the northern part, some in the southern uh, communities in the 1880s. Most became uh, members of the National Business League, which was NBL. And out of that, this was founded, first of all, by Booker T. Washington in uh, the 1900s. And out of that came two local boards. It was the, the Dearborn Board, which is in Chicago, and Harlem, which is in New York. And in 19, that was in 1920. And those two boards are the, still the active boards today, the oldest uh, minority boards today. And uh, the NBL also predates uh, NARAB. And NARAB has played an intricate part and equal opportunity rights, fair housing, and community development legislation at the local, state, and federal level. And these are some of the policies that they have been involved in. The first fair housing legislation in 1962. The national fair housing legislation in both 1947 and 1968. The creation of HUD in 1964. The Voting Rights Act in 1965. Community Reinvestment Act in 1977, Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac in 1992, the Women's Council of NARAB in uh, 1969, Investment Division 1986, and the State of Housing in Black America. That report is called the SHEBA Report. That acronym stands for State of Housing in Black America. 
Central Indiana Realtors Association, which is known as CERA, is the local chapter here in Indianapolis. It was founded in August of 2012. Our mission is to serve the unserved and the underserved. The legacy of home ownership is still a new concept in most of our communities. While other communities have learned from generations the ins and outs of home ownership, our communities have been left as renters and tenants, and it's still active today. That is going on. Home ownership provides a community with pride, and when you have something that you are proud of and you have vested in that, you take care of that. And the future of, uh, and that provides for the future of your communities, or our communities. Zero goal is to educate our community to the benefits and the responsibilities of home ownership. The greatest of all, or of all our abilities, is the ability to serve others. CIRA will utilize the combined knowledge, resources, and compassion it has to serve our community. We want to be a resource in the community because there are vital services that are still needed in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and have caused devastation in the neighborhood and among families. Again, CIRA is an organization that is committed to achieving the vision, and that vision is democracy and housing. And I will leave with this, together we can. Thank you, Amy. Next, Gurinder Hull, Chief Executive Officer of the Immigrant Welcome Center. We were happy to have the center uh, be willing to speak here today to represent far too many new immigrants to our country who are blocked with racial covenants uh, at that time and who today still experience high levels of housing discrimination. Gurinder? Thank you, Amy. I knew I was going to do that. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Mayor Hogsett and uh, honorable guests. I am beyond honored to be given this space to make remarks about how housing disparities impact individuals who are trying to feel welcomed in communities that they were not born or brought up in. You've heard a lot about how the housing inequities have impacted people of color, immigrants, whether they are coming from Europe or whether they are coming from South America or Africa, they face multiple challenges, including language access. Imagine looking at an application when you are not literate in your own language, trying to fill an application for housing, let alone uh, thinking about what documentation is needed when you have crossed the border without anything in your hands, maybe just a backpack that you've arrived with. This conversation that we're having today, this exhibit, is important for many reasons. For our immigrants, we need to be thinking about just as the policies related to redlining, uh, covenants, etc. What are those policies that are important for our immigrants to be able to move from being renters to being homeowners? I ask you and I ask you to reflect on those questions. The answers are very simple, such as having language access, such as making sure that the documentation requirements are clearly outlined such as making sure that covenants that keep people of color in communities are addressed. Thank you very much. And we are nearing the end of our press conference today with three last speakers. Next, Amina Pearson, Executive Director of the Martindale Brightwood Community Development Corporation, here to speak on behalf of a neighborhood that that map over there redlined at one time. Amina? Thank you, Amy, and good morning, everyone. I am so happy that this exhibit is here, but I feel like People who don't know and may not want to know may never see it or know about it unless we share about it. My name is Amina Pearson. Pearson, I'm with the uh, Martindale Brightwood Community Development Corporation. I've been the executive director there for three years. Our neighborhood is 
97% of people of color with a $27,000 average um, income annually. So it is a depressed neighborhood. It is a neighborhood that was redlined. I'm such a visual person. I just want to give you an idea because we know what happened from all the research that we've done. We really don't know why, the true underlying um, of why it happened. When we try to correct it, what does that look like? Before I came to the uh, Martindale Brightwood Community Development Corporation, I worked six years at a bank in community and economic development. So I saw across 10 different uh, footprints what inequality and spatial inequality looked like, people trying to con contain other people in certain areas. Most cities have numbered streets. And let's say we're trying to get from 2nd Street to 98th Street, and you have people walking up the street, right? They're, they're on their way to where they need to be for prosperity. So these people are walking. Other people come in and they're walking. So the first group was maybe at uh, 13th Street. The first group, second group gets on at 2nd Street. And then we have uh, African Americans and non-white um, people coming in to start from 2nd Street. And the first people are already up to 30th Street and they look behind. Oh my God, these people are catching up with us. What do we do? So they drop some glass on the ground. They shut some doors so that the people coming behind them can't get through as easily. They fall. They cut their knees. They have to go to the hospital. They have health bills. Um, the people in the front start running. They make it up to 60th Street. And the uh, second group or third group, group or maybe on 13th Street now. But the door is shut. How do they get through? So the law has changed because this is not right. So, okay, let's stop throwing glass. Let's stop shutting the door. But you already have people at 80th Street, and you still have people on 2nd Street. Okay, so we're not going to throw the glass, but how do you get people equally up there? These people had a disadvantage for so long. And I think we don't see that when we're on 50th Street. We don't see what the people are doing on 2nd Street, and we don't see what the roadblocks are. So now I'm going to talk about where I am in Martindale Brightwood, and there is a bright, bright future because more of us are doing things about it. More of us are putting things in place. You guys have heard the, the changes that are in place and the fact that we are here is that we're behind it. We want it to be the right way. So we're taking, I came in, we were over $100,000 in debt. So taking my banking intellect or knowledge or experience, working with the culture of the um, residents in a neighborhood, and gosh, that is a rich neighborhood of active citizens. There are over, I, I would say, 40 percent seniors, and these seniors have been active in politics, active in their community and what's going on for years, but now they're seniors. And this area has been systematically disinvested in, and it doesn't happen by chance. It's a plan. Unfortunately, it's a government plan. So how do you go and change what the government has planned for the neighborhood? You start in the most undesirable part of the neighborhood and you build, and that's what we're doing. We have a five-year plan, and I'm so excited about it because I see it coming. With the help of people like Amy and the Fair Housing um, Center, things are coming together. I feel like we've been crawling and scratching and arguing for three years, but this year there have been so many breakthroughs that I can clearly see that we're getting to the top and it's a model that we'll be able to document and have other people follow. And that's what we need. When we find the right path, share it with people. Uh, you'll see development in the Brightwood side of Martindale Brightwood. It's already coming from the west side, but we're starting on the east, so we're going to disrupt, I think, the plan that others had for our neighborhood and from within we're building with our residents affordable housing and we're preserving affordable housing and we're helping people to may not need affordable housing in the future. So with that I'm just saying keep your eyes on Martindale Brightwood and uh, I'm happy that we all are here but I do ask that we share what we are doing and what's being presented with others. Thank you. Thanks. Marshawn Wally, uh, African Amer with the African American Coalition of Indianapolis, to say a couple words. 1968 Civil Rights Act, home ownership was around 46%. 2018, 50 years later, black home ownership was around 46%. That doesn't happen by accident. 
when we localize this particular issue, we note that 48% uh, of black people live in majority black neighborhoods. 88% of them have homes that are undervalued or valued lower than the median income. 42% are below $75,000. We are not at the African American Coalition um, resigned to just allowing this to occur. In 2020, we announced a black agenda that included the Fair Housing uh, Coalition of Central Indiana because we knew that they were a partner for our progress. Moving forward with the Indianapolis African American Quality of Life Initiative, we will be advocating for funding of real estate developers and other people that, that are, are part of that system. We'll be advocating for laws that deal with home appraisals. We were proud to be uh, supporters of laws that got rid of racial covenants back in 2021. They were still on the books. We were proud to stand with the Fair Housing of Central Indiana on eviction expungement this last legislative session. We wanted some other things in the bill, but we got what we got. Um, what I think is important as we stand here is that in a moment where the nation is trying to get us to stop talking about critical race theory, the numbers that I shared with you, the, the ability to see that problem and to formulate solutions like reparations or uh, some of the policy formations that we're going for with the black agenda don't happen unless you can look at the law, understand the systems that are attacking you, undermining you, and derive solutions. And so while we have significant problems ahead of us, I'm proud to be a partner with CIRA, with the Concerned Clergy, with uh, the Indianapolis Urban League, and all those who stand with Fair Housing in Central Indiana to try to make progress on what is really American dream. I started with Dr. Martin Luther King. He talked about, in his most famous speech, the, um, the promissory note that was marked uh, funds undeposited. We want our funds. Thank you. And our last speaker today is Tom Krishan, Legal Director of Indiana Disability Rights and also President of the Board of Directors of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Amy. Uh, my name is Tom Krishan. I'm the Legal Director for Indiana Disability Rights and the President of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana Board of Directors. I am excited to welcome everyone to this month-long interactive exhibit. Uh, as others have mentioned, it is appropriate this exhibit opens today, April 11th, this being the 54th anniversary of the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act, uh, which prohibited discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on certain protected classes. The purpose was to address discriminatory practices and barriers to home ownership, some of which we see in the exhibit today, racial covenants, blockbusting, and redlining. Unfortunately, as we are all too well aware, housing discrimination continues today, often taking new forms, but having the same discriminatory effect and the profound impact on those who experience it. As Mayor Hogsad mentioned, this is not a distant problem, but happening right here in Indianapolis. This exhibit is also appropriately timed as part of the 10-year anniversary of the founding of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, which attempts to address these barriers daily. I am in awe at the incredible impact to the individuals affected by all forms of housing discrimination and the Hoosier community as a whole that this nonprofit has had. I regularly hear from national fair housing leaders about the amazing work being done by this organization, truly making it one of the preeminent fair housing organizations in the country. One area of impact has been in the disability community as demonstrated by the Accessibility Award from the City of Indianapolis, which recognizes organizations that make exceptional contributions to eliminating barriers for people with disabilities. In addition to regularly advocating with individuals with disabilities to obtain housing accommodations and modifications, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana has pursued necessary enforcement actions to address housing discrimination with positive results, including, for instance, in an apartment complex in northern Indiana that implemented a mandatory relocation policy if its residents could no longer independently perform activities of daily living. With the entities responsible for the design and construction of 12 apartment complexes recently built completely inaccessibly to people with disabilities, removing much needed accessible units from the housing markets in those rural areas where they are located. With an apartment complex right here in Indianapolis that denied a housing application of someone who used a wheelchair because the complex said it would be a liability for her to live there, 
and another Indianapolis complex here in Indianapolis that a landlord tried to evict a resident with a disability simply because she was utilizing a hospital bed in her living room. These resolutions not only provided needed relief to those individuals encountering discrimination, but the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana also made certain that injunctive relief and systemic fixes were included so violations would not be repeated. In addition to enforcement work, exhibits like this are imperative to ensure people understand the history of fair housing and the impact housing discrimination has on people who experience it. I'm hopeful participants will not only recommend that friends and colleagues attend, but also share what they learn with others. This is something that we can and should do, educate others on these important issues. I am thankful you all are here and I hope you enjoy the exhibit today. Thank you everybody, thank you for your time here today. Please spread the word, this exhibit is open here through the end of April. We're looking for a place to take it in May. Hopefully we can maybe take it to the Urban League in June, Tony? Maybe, maybe Urban League in June. Um, but if there's somewhere we could take it in May, we would love to do that. Let us know, keep us posted. Otherwise, um, enjoy the exhibit, tell uh, everybody about it, and thank you so much for your time today. And please um, do something, spread the word. Uh, Fight the fight. Uh, let's make fair housing a reality. Thank you.